now, welcome back to the Deadology Podcast. From Pencil Hill Studio, New Paltz, New York, I'm your host, Howard Weiner. Today is May 29th, 2024, and this is Season 2, Episode 21 of the podcast. I had a nice show planned for you today, and I got an even better one now. Unfortunately, due to the passing of the great Bill Walton. So I scrapped um, whatever I had planned for this week's episode, and we're going to dedicate this podcast to a celebration of the life of the extraordinary uh, Hall of Fame basketball player, number one deadhead, Bill Walton. And uh, before we jump into that, I just want to let you guys know about the Next two weeks, what we have coming up on the podcast, Um, next week's going to be amazing. Um, I'm I'm very excited about these next two weeks. Um, We got the quest for Music Mountain next week. Uh, My friend Perry Paletta, a gifted musician, mandolinist, uh, guitarist, you know, just a great musician, great guy. Went to a lot of Grateful Dead shows with him through the years. Uh, We're going to talk about, we were both at Music Mountain, we didn't go to that show together, but we were both there, and we also went back and found the Music Mountain stage 40 years after the show, 40 years that stage was still there, and we listened to the entire show that day, Um, so it's the quest for Music Mountain, but for the most part, we're going to just get into the great music and from that show, and what an amazing... uh, day it was in Jerry Garcia Band Folklore, Music Mountain. And the following week, uh, we're going to do the 40th anniversary of uh, the Des Moines show, June 16th, 1974, The Wall of Sound, Uh, Grateful Dead, Taper, Legendary Taper, Doug Schmel will be back on the program, uh, bringing his uh, enthusiasm and knowledge again. Uh, So that's going to be another awesome episode. Uh, on the 40th anniversary, um, that, and that's why I'm doing Music Mountain the week before because I, I want to on the 40th anniversary. I want that show to be the uh, Iowa show, obviously, and then Music Mountain will be the week earlier. They both share the same date, June 16th. And now May 27th is going to kind of live in infamy. Um, unfortunately, that's will, will be known to a lot of deadheads now as the day Bill Wal- Bill Walton passed away. And what a shock it was, man. Um, I got a text around noon on Monday uh, from my friend, friend Phil and just said, Bill Walton, ugh. Obviously, I had to go right, right at Google. I knew something happened. It was an accident. Something happened. And Bill Walton was dead. And it was just so shocking because for, nobody knew about him. Well, I mean, maybe some people knew about it, but... Um, he was battling cancer, and he just kept that, you know, he, I, he didn't want to bum anybody out. He, uh, he kind of did kept that to himself and, I guess, his family. Uh, but it was just shocking because people who knew him didn't even know about it. You know, all these uh, sports uh, people that he worked with through the years broadcasting didn't know about it. Um, and, and also a guy like Bill Walton, he's the embodiment of enthusiasm, energy, life. So the so the concept concept of death and Bill Walton just doesn't go together. So uh, it, was, it was yeah for that reason it was extremely shocking. Um, you know but, you know when, when you hear people die you know but the, you know but all these different rock musicians that we love and uh, there's, there's something more shocking about it being Bill Walton because uh, you know outside of his bad uh, <clears throat> you know the, the the foot injuries and his surgeries and that. He was a healthy, energetic, most enthusiastic, lively person uh, that, that we know. Uh, so, yeah, it was a rough day, um, but this is going to be a celebration of his life because uh, that, that's the way <laughs> he, he would definitely want him, man. Bill Walton, an amazing person. So I get this text from Phil, and the first thing I think about is just, you know, this, how much this guy loved the Grateful Dead and that the best episode I could tell you about we had one one I had one encounter with him with Phil um, I, I guess we call it an encounter whatever you want to call it we're at, an, at a net Celtics game uh, Phil's from the Boston area and um, obviously he's a Celtic fan 
Uh, I'm rooting for the Nets. And we're, we're in the Meadowlands. 1986, the years that the Celtics were freaking awesome. You know, Larry Bird, all those guys are there. So the Celtics are pulling away. It's the third quarter. We're about 12 rows away from the Celtics bench, a, a little off to the left, but within striking range so that if you yell, yell out loud, somebody on the Celtics bench could hear you. And Phil, as the Celtics break for the huddle, Phil screams out, Hey, Bill, Jack Straw. And he points at his Grateful Dead shirt. Walton looks up. I mean, he, he looks up, points his finger at Phil, both his, both his fingers, and screams, yeah. The enthusiasm this guy had for the Grateful Dead, it was, it was like the most important thing in his life, pretty much. Man, it was like he, he just had that much enthusiasm for everything the, the, the Grateful Dead stood for, the music. Um, just, and he's in a huddle with, with um, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish. Now he had he had his warm ups on. He wasn't um, he wasn't playing at the time. He did play earlier in the game, um, you know. But for him to Phil could have said anything, but because he said Jack Straw, that caught that 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 caught Walton's attention, man. And and he had to react to it. He loves the Grateful Dead. He loves Jack Straw that much. He had to reach out. and He just pointed. And he let out a guttural howl, you know, just to. You know, say a fellow deadheads out there, you know, let me acknowledge him. And it, it was pretty amazing. It, it, a guy on the Celtics bench, he could, he could have said, Bill, anything, and the guy's not responding. If I'm on if I'm on the team and I'm with Larry Bird and, you know, and uh, Parrish and Dennis Johnson, all those guys, I'm probably going to ignore somebody yelling out to me no matter what it is. But that's how much enthusiasm, what a free spirit that guy was. And uh, well, maybe the fact that Casey Jones was the uh, coach had something to <laughs> something to do with it. But um, yeah, Bill Walton, and the re- the reason I remember that incident so well, it just it, it was who he was. He was the Grateful Dead's greatest ambassador. Every step of the way in that guy's career, um, you know, whether he's in at UCLA talking to Sports Illustrated, you know, in, in Portland. Um, bringing Celtics to the uh, to to a dead show, all the broadcasts he did, he would always go out of his way to throw a Grateful Dead line in or something, and all the shows he's seen through the years, just so consistently, it was it was just such an, a a huge part of his life, and he's the most famous deadhead, all obviously the most famous, but also the most enthusiastic. So, I mean, it was a huge loss for the Grateful Dead family. Uh, but my, my, we're going to do a little tribute, music tribute for Bill Walton here. And um, by the way, all the songs I'm going to pick today, uh, I have four selections. They're all going to be from the West Coast to honor Bill Walton. Um, I know the show could be a little East Coast centric. Um, you know, obviously, most of the shows I saw were on the East Coast, uh, down South, Midwest. I got out to California for only one show in my in my day. Um, so we're, we're going to stay on the West Coast for this, for Bill Walton. And what better way than to start off with a hot jack straw? This one's from Angels Camp, California, August 23rd, uh, 1987. Uh, Carlos Santana uh, played with the dead, did the last two songs, Ico, Ico, Watchtower. Uh, but the show kicked off with Box of Rain into Jack Straw. And... I'm going to play the entire straw. As you know, on the Deadology podcast, I usually play portions of songs. But for Bill Walton, we're going to do the whole song intact. Uh, but we're going to segue out of a Box of Rain just because the ending of that is so so poignant. And I think it, it fits the moment as we go into this Jack Straw. Such a long, long time to be gone and a short time to be there. The rain will ease the pain and love will see you through. Just a box of rain, rain and water. Believe it if you need it. If you don't, just pass it on. Beating it in the 
Smoking Jack Straw in Memory of Bill Walton. That's from uh, August 23rd, 1987, Angel Camp, California. And um, I'm sure Bill Walton must have been there. I mean, it's it's a California show, the summer of 1987. Where else would Bill Walton be? Uh, so, yeah, and they followed it up with a West L.A. fadeaway right after the Straw. I mean, West L.A. after Straw is just like the perfect song that funky blues riff and yeah, nothing like a, a boxer rain, Jack Straw, West LA fadeaway to get the show going that night. And um, yeah, so Bill Walton had Hall of Fame basketball career. It all started in Helix High School. And he didn't lose his basketball team there, didn't lose for two years. And then he goes to UCLA, joins John Wooden in the great tradition they have there at UCLA. They won 88 straight games with uh, Walton. So between his high school in Helix High and UCLA, he won 127 consecutive basketball games. Uh, that's ridiculous. The, the UC, I know the UCLA record is the record for college basketball. He was the three-time, he played three years. In those days, the freshmen uh, didn't play for UCLA. Uh, and he won player of the year three years in a row. So just, a, he was, some call him the greatest uh, college basketball player ever. Hard, hard to argue with that. And he came on the heels of perhaps the other, one of the greatest college basketball players ever, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And um, it was known as Lou Alcindor at the time. And I just, I have a funny a anecdote about that before I uh, move forward with, uh, with Bill here. Um, I'm, I'm eight, nine years old. I'm watch, reading Sports Illustrated, following things in the newspaper. I mean, you couldn't watch too many UCLA games or really any kind of NBA games on uh, the TV as it was in the 1970s. They just didn't broadcast that much. Uh, so that, that was my way of following it. And I kind of adopted the Bucks as what well. the Knicks were my favorite team, and I adopted the Bucks as a like a second favorite team. So I really liked Lou Alcindor, or Oscar Robertson, and I, I'm going to look at the paper at the start of one year, and I'm looking at the leading scorers, and there's this this guy on who's the leading scorer in the NBA, Abdul Jabber for for, for Milwaukee. I'm like, who is this, and where's Lou Alcindor? And eventually, I figured out that. Uh, he did what Muhammad Ali did, changed his name, uh, his mu Muslim name, which is a very cool sounding name, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. And, um, you know, man, that he had, Jabbar had what, one thing Walton didn't have longevity. He just, you know, didn't get injured. It was, it was, it was incredible. And poor Bill, man, he went through so many injuries through the years. But um, nothing was stopping him early on. He was, he was the king of uh, college basketball. His first loss was to Notre Dame. I happened to watch that game. As a kid, I, I did root against Bill Walton because I saw him on the cover of Sports Illustrated, redhead guy. I'm, I'm nine years old. I don't, I don't understand the Grateful Dead or anything. Um, but they, they lost to Notre Dame to stop that 88 game winning streak. And, um, you know, so that, I think that was the first UCLA basketball game I saw. And also the first time I ever heard of the Grateful Dead was looking at that Sports Illustrated article where Walton. Talked, he was talking about you know and being a deadhead, and Jack, he mentioned he, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but he pulled put Jack Straw out there as his favorite song, 
And, um, you know, at the time I'm listening to AM radio, the only cool band I, I was into at the time was the Beatles. Uh, but yeah, so right away, my, my first introduction to the Grateful Dead at all came, came from Bill Walton. So at UCLA, uh, besides playing basketball, you know, Walton got involved in anti-war protests and just the, the relationship with him and John Wooden, uh, his legendary coach and great teacher, that should be a movie. I mean, that that's that that's incredible. Just you know, and, and the thing with Walton, he was a free spirit, um, but he he understood that he was in the presence of a great teacher, and you know he took the lessons with him, and it you know made him a better person uh, throughout life. Uh, so that that UCLA period just a, an amazing period of growth for for Walton in so many ways. Oh, oh yeah, and the Grateful Dead played there <laughs> a few times, and he got to see some great shows, none bigger than November 17th, 1973. And I, I believe Walton wrote some liner notes for the Dave, Dave's Picks. I'm not sure because um, I don't collect CDs anymore. I just got the digital music. Um, I, don't, I don't even have a CD set up in my, uh, where, where I live anymore. It's all, all digital. Otherwise, I would be buying these uh, re- releases. But I think um, Walton wrote the liner notes. I wish I had a chance to read them. But, uh, you know, it was a huge show for him. And, you know, it won- one of the all-time best Grateful Dead shows. Um, and that, that amazing 80-minute masterpiece, playing in the band, into Uncle John's, into Morning Dew, back into Uncle John's, and then the playing reprise. Nothing like it, man. Just it, it had to blow their minds. Just anybody who was there, and especially Walton, is all full of love for the Grateful Dead at that time. Uh, so let's let's take a listen to. Um, obviously, we can't do the whole eighty minute section here, but um, let's listen to that playing reprise. I think it's the best playing reprise I've, I've ever heard. Just Garcia and the band just going off here. Um, it's almost like a Tiger Jam. Just. Fusion fireballs, incredible, incredible, mind blowing music here. Playing in the band, Bill Walton was there for sure. November 17th, 1973, Pauly Pavilion, UCLA.
the rousing conclusion to the playing in the band, Uncle John's band, Morning Dew, back into Uncle John's band, back into playing in the band, Sandwich. Amazing stuff from the Grateful Dead. Bill Walton was eating it up. A tasty sandwich for Bill that night. And yeah, right now I'm listening to Back from the Dead, his uh, autobiography. I got, I got the audio book. I, I read it a couple years ago, and I'm telling you, this audio book is incredible. Just hear Walton's enthusiasm. He does a great job, uh, you know, just narrating his his, his own story, um, and it, it's it gives you the feeling Bill's still with you, man. So I would highly recommend getting the, you know, either reading it or getting the audio book. But it is one of the best audio books I've uh, ever listened to. Really in, enjoying that, and you know. It, you feel Bill's still alive, still there with you when, you, when you're listening to this audio book. So might be a great thing for you guys to go out there and uh, listen to as we uh, remember the incredible life of Bill Walton. And, and what, the one thing that strikes me as I'm listening to this again, how humble he was. Again, when they played Memphis, he won his second uh, NCAA title with UCLA. They're playing Memphis. He undoubtedly had the greatest game anybody's ever had in the NCAA tournament. He missed one shot. I believe he scored 44 points and whatever amount of rebounds he had. I'm not looking at a stat sheet right now. And when Walton talks about this, he doesn't mention it like he had the greatest game. He's giving all the credit to the to his teammates, this and that. And you and come away from this not even realizing how great he was and how everybody kind of perceived him. This guy, they kept putting him on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Um, you know, other teams would have moved the the world to get Bill Walton in in, in the draft in the in the NBA upcoming NBA draft. It, it was enormous. He was he was so great. But when when you listen to him, even when he's talking about his time with the Trailblazers and the the accomplishments he had, he's always deferring to the team and you know how how great how he would be nothing without his teammates. So um, you know. He, I have to go to YouTube just to remind myself of how great he was and see some of these highlights again because the statistics are off the hook. That man played defense it was like he was like a Bill Russell out there pretty much until until he hurt his foot his feet. Um, you know he, he could score. You know he he had everything, man. He was like almost like a six eleven Larry Bird. You know it, it was incredible. It, it would have been if he could have kept getting better and better if, if he didn't have the injuries. It uh, the sky was a limit to what Bill Walton uh, could have been. But what he was, was more than good enough to get him into the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. So just an incredible talent, incredible human being, and the Grateful Dead's greatest ambassador. <laughs> so um, after UCLA, he gets drafted by the Portland Trailblazers. He, he, was, he was happy to be in Portland, man, stay out on the West Coast, um, pretty excited about gets out there, and this is where the foot injury started. His, his first year out in Portland, hurt his foot. It wasn't easily detectable. He had some stress fractures and things like that. It would, it would just reoccur, and just an incredible pain he would go through. Uh, but that that was to be the beginning of the downfall. His, his first year when he got that first injury, he just he was born with structurally terrible feet, and you know all this, all this playing. You know, just um, ev- eventually took its toll. Uh, but he, you know, he rebounded. He went into his second season. Then he had the same injury with his foot. Finally, by his third season in Portland, um, he, he got to play pretty much a full season, and he was incredible. He was second in the MVP voting to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Had Maurice Lucas on his team. Um, you know, and they. They they did something so incredible. They were they were such a young team, no no real veteran leadership on the team. Uh, Maurice Lucas, Walton, Johnny Davis came in later in the year. Uh, they they just went waltzed their way to the NBA title. Um, in in the to get to the finals, the Portland Trail Blazers swept the Los Angeles Lakers four straight, and this is where I took note. As you know, I, I liked Kareem. I liked the Lakers as a, as a backup team to the Knicks. Um, I liked the Lakers as they, you know, when Philadelphia and Boston in the years to follow would come to the finals. 
that's why I rooted for the Lakers. I, you know, I had a root against the, the Philadelphia and Boston. And so I always liked Cream and Magic, and Magic would come down a few years later. But what I saw, what, what uh, Walton did to Kareem, and yeah, he was incredible in that series. And once again, in, in his book, he's very humble about it, but he basically destroyed Kareem in that series and the Lakers. And um, and then they went on and beat Portland. And once again, when he's talking about, about playing the Trailblazers in that series, he gives all the credit to Johnny Davis and obviously Maurice Lucas, who deserves a ton of credit. Uh, but he was the MVP, man. He was, you know, everybody looked at him because he was the best player on the court for for like all, all these years. And then the following year, Portland starts the season 50 and 10. And then the foot injury happens again, just incredible pain in his foot. And they can't really diagnose it. And they're giving him shots to go out there and he further hurts it. And it's, it's like a whole just terrible ordeal when you when you listen to it. Uh, just so uh, depressing. That's the only. That's the only thing I could think of as, as I was listening to it. You know, this poor guy's. You know, who has such desire and hunger to play good, and um, you know, he just he can't do it because he's got this pain in his feet. And people th- are thinking he's making it up, this and that. Uh, but he was the MVP in the league that year. He was so great in 1978. That was his last true greatness. I mean, super greatness as a basketball player that year, and. Um, Hey, right now I think it would be a great time to take another music break, celebrate Bill Walton's life. He's in Portland. Um, two two amazing uh, facts here with the uh, with with the Dead in Portland. He first met the Grateful Dead. It wasn't his first show. He'd obviously seen them a bunch of times, but 1976 at the Paramount Theater. Um, you know, he got invited backstage. Ramrod uh, came out and got him. Uh, they brought him backstage and. The Dead and Walton just hit it off right away. The, the Dead were coming to his basketball games. And, um, you know, after that, it was like he was he was tight with the Grateful Dead from that point moving forward. And um, 1977 is the year Portland wins the championship. October 77, they're, they were playing in Portland. And obviously, Bill Walton had to be there. And those were two incredible nights. And this performance of The Music Never Stopped is one of the greatest ever. This is from... October 1st, 1977.
Uh, the extra effort makes that one of the greatest music never stops of all time. Uh, so the band just kills it. Great performance. And they're headed uh, wrapping it up. And Jerry's like the old v- the old Jerry Garcia Vito. Not yet. He comes back and somehow whips it into another another great jam there. So uh, that Portland one, definitely one of the best in 1977. Um, I put it third. 1977 is a spectacular year for the music never stopped. I got um, Buffalo 5977 is number one. Um, there's one from Denver, uh, October 9th. Ridiculous. That one's number two. I think I have this one at number three from Portland. Um, so Portland, man. Portland Trailblazers, Bill Walton. Um, he had his greatest... Um, NBA performance, but that the height of, of Bill Walton greatness in uh, Portland, and he won the MVP his second year. But that injury um, ruined the relationship between Walton and the Trailblazers. Um, he felt he was mistreated by the medical staff. They gave him a uh, some kind of shot, and he went out and further injured himself. Uh, so it led to a year where he took a break. And if you're Bill Walton, you're taking a break. And your friends are the Grateful Dead. You're going to Egypt, man. So <laughs> from the uh, Pyramid of Success with John Wooden, he went to the real pyramids in Egypt with the Grateful Dead. Had an awesome time out there. Um, yeah, great great way to spend uh, spend your downtime, man. Head to Egypt with uh, Jerry and the Camels. So um, the, the Egypt shows were decent. Uh, they definitely, not typical... Grateful Dead, a whole bunch of things went into that. You're out in Egypt. There was all kinds of different things. So they perhaps were, it wasn't a great run. But but I'll tell you, there's one one thing you need, one highlight you need to check out from that Egypt show. If you don't know it already, September 16th, 78, the, the Shakedown Street. It's the second version of Shakedown. Uh, they don't have the well, 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 you can never tell uh, chorus in yet. Um, they're missing one verse from the song. But they just go off on this 10-minute jam that's wild, man. It's, it's one of the coolest things you'll ever hear. 9-16-78, Shakedown Egypt. And also Bill Walton joined the band on drums. So um, in basketball, not so good. In the Grateful Dead world, everything's perfect. And um, Bill then went to join his, uh, the San Diego Clippers for a couple years. And once again, he thought he was recovered the foot injuries again, just one after another. This man had 31 surgeries on his foot, 37 altogether, but 31 specifically on his foot. It's like he would finish a year and they would have to have three surgeries just to get the loose bone out of there. Um, so, that, I mean, it was it was crazy. He probably should have retired right after the Portland thing and never played basketball again. But he loves the, he loved the Grateful Dead and he loved basketball, so... Uh, the show, the show must go on, man. So he's he's in the he's with the Clippers. The injuries are hounding him, and it, it, we hit the point where it's 1984, 85, and he, you know he's had it with the Clippers. They got Donald Sterling as their owner. Um, they're out of San Diego. They're now in Los Angeles. He actually, while he was with the, during this Clipper thing, there was one year where he took a break. And he, was, he went back to law school. He went to Stanford. This Bill Walton story is just its so amazing. You know, even the, 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 this kind of dark period in his career, all the, it's, a, it's such a wild story, man. So that's why I so recommend, get, if you haven't read the autobiography or um, you haven't read it in a number of years, go back to it. It's, just, it's mind-boggling that he actually was studying law and he did a whole year there. And then, of course... All these people that are having fun with him, his classmates, play on this intramural team with us, play with... And all of a sudden, like, after after he didn't get to rest his foot, he started to feel good again. And he eventually left law school and worked his way back to the Clippers because he loved the game of basketball too much. You know, so he's, he's, he's feeling good enough to give it another run. He went back to the Clippers. Yeah, he played a little bit, the injuries, you know, the, the, the whole thing still ha- ha- haunting him. But he, he got this desire to just leave the Clippers and he was like where do I want to go he had a few choices you know a few teams that he was thinking about going to Lakers the Lakers didn't want to didn't want to mess with him 
they had just beaten the Celtics and and won the um, I believe it was the '85 championship. And the Celtics, um, he called up Red R back, and the story is kind of like Larry Bird's in the room, and he cups and you know it, Walton lets him know that he wants to play for the Celtics, and. Auerbach asks Bird, he cups the phone, Walton does not know that Larry Bird's in the room with Red at this time, and uh, Larry Bird said, yep, he, he, he wanted Walton, he's like, get him, so um, it, it took a little while, they had to work it out with the Clippers, but Walton joined the Celtics, and to him that was just, you know, it was, it was like being at UCLA again, just having that, joining that level of excellence, a team that's just, you know, on the right path, one thing in mind, perfection, teamwork, working to, to the goal. You know, kind of like being a part of the Grateful Dead, part of UCLA. Now he had it with the Boston Celtics. And um, what, what a cool thing it is that Walton was there to, to tell the stories of the Celtics from 86. Uh, another thing that makes this, this book so amazing. You know, you, you won't get these stories anywhere, but but from the Walton perspective. And an amazing thing, it was a miracle. He went, all these surgeries went through, hard to fathom that he could put out a good year. But the Celtics got him, used him as a six man. Uh, They just expected a certain amount of minutes, 10, 15 minutes out of him to back up Robert Parrish. They didn't expect him to be the best player in the world. That Those days were long gone just because his his feet were gone. And um, by some miracle... And this is definitely a miracle. He played 80 games for the Celtics, and he won the Sixth Man of the Year award. You know, just a, such a great last hurrah for Walton. Um, he, you know, very few people thought he had it in the tank, but I think it was just the, the excitement of him being with the Celtics. He mind over matter. He just he made it happen. He went out there. The Celtics won their championship. He had the time of their life. And um, he had the time of his life. And so it was such a very close-knit team. And one, one day, you know, they're, they're, they know the, they, they see the hippies coming to town. They're asking Walton about it. They're like, we want to go see the Grateful Dead. So well, obviously Walton arranged that. Uh, November 4th, November 5th, um, 1985. They're in the Worcester Centrum. I think he brought the Celtics to, to both shows. Casey Jones didn't go, the coach. Um, Danny Ainge didn't go, uh, being the Mormon. Um, you know, he couldn't couldn't clear it with his wife, but I think most of the team was there. You know, just think of the Grateful Dead out there backstage. They have a little. They they set apart a little place for the for the because you can't have like ten NBA guys standing on the middle of the floor. It's a too much of a, of a ruckus. They put a little offstage thing for them, a great accommodations. They had the time of their lives, and the Celtics asked to come back the next night. Uh, I remember those nights very very well because November 4th was my birthday. November 5th was Walton's birthday. And um, yeah, they, they were good shows, the Worcester shows. Um, but on that tour, I, I, I do think there was a couple of better stops. They, they, they were incredible in Richmond. I think that was the... 31st, no, it was, it was the 1st and 2nd in Richmond. They were incredible in Rochester on the 7th and 8th and the Brendan Byrne 10th and 11th. Maybe maybe just the, the pressure of uh, having the all these legends, Larry Bird and uh, Walton introduced everybody. You know, Larry, this is Jerry. Robert, this is uh, Bob Weir. You know, just, uh, they, he was introducing everybody. It was, pro- it was probably like a Pretty crazy for the Grateful Dead with uh, all this, the Celtic legends sitting right there on, on the side, the best basketball players in the world. Um, but yeah, me- memorable nights in, in Worcester. Uh, incredible. Once again, the, the great ambassador bringing people who normally wouldn't be into the Grateful Dead, exposing like the, the, the rest of the world to his true love, the Grateful Dead. And an, a great little story. For the first time I heard this, um, after... Bill, Bill passed away. All these, I mean, he had he had such a great resurrection as a broadcaster, and um, but Rick Carl, Carlisle came on. He was he's coaching the Indiana Pacers. They just lost to the Celtics, and this was before the fourth game they had lost. And he just found out about about Walton's passing, and he was just cho- all choked up, man. He, you could just see it. He, he could barely talk. 
but he, he recalled one one amazing thing that Walton did for him, and uh, he was so thankful for it. Um, he was going out on a first date with a, with a girl, and he wanted to see the Grateful Dead. They were playing at the Cap Center that night in 1987. And he called up Walt, and he's like, Bill, is there any way you could get me into this into this show? And Bill said, no problem. This is what you do. Go to the back door, knock on the back door, ask for Dennis McNally, and tell him you're Rick Carlisle with the Boston Celtics. And, of course, he got in. And the, the great part of this story is the, the woman that he was dating that night it worked out pretty good. That's now Rick Car- Carlisle's uh, wife. So, yeah, the Grateful Dead bring in bringing people together, just, you know, how many people got married, hooked up, friends, you know, just the the, the community of the Grateful Dead is, is huge. And this guy was, he was like the Moses of our community in a way, man. Bill Bill Walton is lar- larger than life, man. Well, what a great life he lived. That's, that's really why his death is, uh, it was so shocking just to, he's gone, man, just, you know, Unfortunate, but he no no he may lived a, a thousand lives, man. Just incredible what he, what he what he lived, and um, yeah, continued to go through those those tough times. But he he found himself as as an announcer, a broadcaster, and this is a guy who had a stuttering problem all his life. You know, just uh, he worked at it. You know, he he took to heart the John Wooden. Uh, pyramid of success went to work he was determined to be a broadcaster because his other love besides the Grateful Dead was basketball man and he, he went out there and he, he worked for just about every major network was doing NBA college basketball he did anything that he, he could get to you know it wasn't about the money it was just about the love he had about there if it didn't work out at one place he was going back to another broadcasting job going on another ESPN show uh, joining podcasts, doing whatever he had to do because he loved it, like he like he loved the Grateful Dead, and on his passing, every Stephen A. Every you know, like it, when when a, when a great ball player dies, they talk about his accomplishments, and of course, everybody brought up the he was the MVP, won two titles with UCLA, one with the Celtics, he won with the Trailblazers. Everybody brings up all that, but. It, Half of the tributes were just what a great person he was and how much that that person knew Walton because of the broadcasting and loved him. Walton was the type of guy who would come in there, never about him. He would always ask you about your family, um, just one of those people that made you feel better about yourself. And um, so, yeah, all the all the John Wooden teaching and he had he had great parents, too. Uh, they, they, they weren't into music, but they, they definitely raised a great son. Uh, so yeah, re- really sad passing uh, for to lose Bill Walton. Uh, whether you're in the sports world, Grateful Dead, or any kind of world, man, uh, just a a great man lived 71 years to the fullest. And I hate to do this to you, man, but that's <laughs> we we heard three songs so far. And now it's time for the tearjerker. Uh, we're gonna go to uh, a, a broke down palace, and and to me this is. This this is like a sacred piece, man. This, this can make this could bring tears to my eyes without thinking about anybody passing away. Uh, but I think this one's perfect right now. Um, fare you well, my honey. Fare you well, my only true one. Big Red Bill Walton. Uh, this one is from July twenty first, nineteen eighty four. Ventura. Just such heartfelt singing from Garcia and a great guitar solo. Enjoy. Oh, down past 
We love you more than words can tell. Next week on the Deadology Podcast, Music Mountain and the Jerry Garcia Band. I'm your host, Howard Weiner. Thanks for listening. Peace out.